Hello everyone, this is Cam, and I am going to be covering a little bit of the how the Graybert mechanical keyboard was designed. In particular, in this video, we are going to focus on the PCB. Uh, so here I've got pulled up the open source hardware repository, and you can just scroll through some of the pictures. So really, like I said, uh, I want to start off with how I started to design the Kind of requirements for the PCB and the keyboard itself and then how I did that in KiCad or KiCad whatever you say. Um, so here's some of the pictures so I'll kind of cover just starting from what features we want then what electronic components we'll use to make those features then what sort of layout we want and how we want to lay out the layout in the PCB and then maybe some extra features. I'm not going to be going over like detailed KiCad usage. I'm not going to go over detailed library usage, but more like how do you start from wanting to do something and then actually making it happen along with some tips along the way. So to dive in, um, we will start with just the features. So when I started to design this, I decided that I wanted an OLED screen that was going to go in sort of the top left of the keyboard. I wanted a rotary encoder with a switch in it. I wanted USB-C and I wanted the sort of 60% layout with of course a 32-bit microcontroller. Um, so one of the big things for me that I felt like not many people have done is Everyone seems to be using diodes and a matrix to scan for key presses. Well, modern chips, you know, have huge packages. You can get 100 pin, 144 pin packages. So if you have all the pins, why not use them? Um, so in this in this design, I just went with a 100 pin package that would easily fit the 60 or 65 inputs for each key presses and the screen and the encoder. Um, so I didn't have to do diodes. So that reduces component count incredibly small, uh, where you really just have some supporting resistors and capacitors, voltage regulator and connector, and then of course your layout. So that's sort of what I started with in my head. And what you want to do after that is sort of get your generic measurement and um, how you want that design to look. So my design here is gonna have our chip up top and have some extra space here where the screen and the encoder go, and then the key presses down below. Okay, so let's jump in to the KiCad schematic layout. So I think one of the biggest things, like I mentioned to start with, is, is what kind of microcontroller you're gonna use. Um, I decided to use the STM32F072 um, V8 in this case, and T. So to go over this just a little bit in case you're not very familiar with this, the letters after the STM32 are pretty important. So the F series is like the performance line or something like that. Um, and then F0 means it's a Cortex M0. Then 72 is kind of the series of the chip. The X, the 2 here represents that it does crystalless USB, so you don't need any crystal components to clock your microcontroller. And then the seven is sort of the series and peripherals. Um, and then V is the package. So in this case, V I think represents the LQFP 100. So it means it has a hundred pins. You can get other package sizes, but like I said, for this build, we need all of those pins. And then the eight is the memory capacity. I think there's either eight or B. Um, eight is, I believe 64 K and the B is a little bit more than that. So in my opinion, you're totally fine with just the 64K. Most of the Atmel chips that a lot of people build keyboards with only have 32. So double that, I think you're totally fine. Um, so once you have that picked out, it really dictates what supporting components you need for that microcontroller. Most of the time, you can find other open source hardware out there. You can go pull up the um, manufacturer's page and 
in the documentation section, they'll often have reference designs. So they'll tell you how many um, like capacitors, what voltage you need, and they'll give you example circuits, which are always incredible. So for STM, in this case, if you go to documentation, you can find application notes. And these can be really daunting at first when you are first kind of just like want answers. Um, but I think it takes some time and you should try to digest them as much as you can while looking at reference designs. There's a great repository out there um, called Awesome Mechanical Keyboard. Um, these are amazing examples and you can sort of search through here and find things that maybe use the same chip that you do. So look at that, STM32, F072. So you could go look at uh, some of the examples that they have there and find what you need. So in this case, um, most need a voltage regulator. So you'll take your five volt from USB bus, bring it down to the 3V3 for the microcontroller, and then you need some capacitors on that. So I think in my head, there's maybe a little bit of lack of confidence on what these values actually should be. Um, so that's power going to your microcontroller. So I just broke it out here. We have our labels and then that gets fed in in KiCad on the top is 3v3 and the bottom is ground. And we're doing a common ground from the, the USB bus. So some other supporting things for the STM32 series for the most part is you should always break out the debug pins. So we just have reset, serial wire data, input and output, and serial wire, wire clock. Those just, you look up on your data sheet from STM to see what pins those are and then connect them appropriately. In this case, I just have a little connector and if we hit edit on that, we see it's just a 2.54 millimeter pin header. And then another two of the other main components that you need for STM32 would be a boot and a reset. So typically you pull boot low and then you pull reset high. And this way you can trigger the STM32 to go into DFU mode from hardware. So in this case, I've used just plain old connectors. Um, most people put buttons in, but I felt like that was just an extra unnecessary component because pretty much everyone just triggers DFU mode by software anyways. So why should we be adding extra components for that? Um, and then I used 5.1K resistors. Most people would probably just pull a normal 10K because that's kind of the standard for pull up, pull down. But because we need 5.1K resistors for the USB bus, why not use the same component if it does the trick and your power draw is pretty minimal anyways. So that's kind of the supporting. So we've got voltage regulator, serial wire debug, and reset and boot pins for just supporting this STM32F072 in crystalless USB. So that's an incredibly small amount of components um, to just support the microcontroller. Then, of course, like I just started to mention, we need to bring in the USB. So using a USB-C, you can obviously have um, more protocol than just like USB 2.0, but in this case, we're just using plain old USB 2.0. It's just a hardware interface device, so no worries there. We just need these 5.1K resistors for CC1 and CC2, and then we just need to bring the minus and plus of the differential bus to the microcontroller. So one thing here to note um, that I have not totally settled on is there's a lot of different USB-C connectors out there with like slightly different footprints. And it's kind of a gamble on which one you want to use because the stock varies so much, especially if you want one supplier. So this is what I use currently. I think this is prone to change a little bit, maybe um, based on just supply and what is kind of becoming somewhat de facto because USB-C is relatively new in the grand scheme of things. 
So this could change, um, but sticking with the theme of this keyboard, SMD only. So I use this component here. So we've pretty much covered interfacing the microcontroller with the computer via USB. We have the supporting devices to power up the microcontroller. So then we get into features. I mentioned earlier that I wanted a OLED display and a rotary encoder. So KiCad has a footprint or a symbol for a rotary encoder with a switch. But typically, you'll have to create your own footprint for the actual physical layout of the pins. And then we have the OLED screen, which I created my own um, symbol and footprint to represent where that was going to place. And we'll get into that a little bit more as I go into the PCB itself. But just knowing that I needed I squared C for that and for the rotary encoder, we just need some GPIO pins. So flagging those there. And then from the device data sheet, I determine where I squared C pins can be. I decided on PB6 and PB7, and we'll get into why that is a little bit later. And then rotary encoders could go on any GPIO pin. Okay, so let's dive into the keyboard layout. So where the switches are going to be and what switch options you have. So I think everyone should probably have known about Keyboard Layout Editor, an incredible site to help with this. Um, so, and some of this might be personal preference, some may be kind of what people are asking for. But in my case, I chose to model the layout based on the same layout scheme that VIA uses. And that is by defining like a default layout and then alternate keys for something. So this is a 2U backspace that can be opted into two 1U keys. And the way you do that is you basically say, in the top left corner, you say the row and then the column. And then on the bottom right, you say, this is the zeroth configuration and this is config zero. And then out here, you can say that this is still row zero, column 13, but it is the kind of second configuration or one configuration of the zero configuration. Lots of numbers. But I think if you stare at this long enough, you'll understand what I'm saying. So in this case, my layout's gonna support an alternate backspace layout, an alternate right shift, an alternate left shift, and then an alternate modifier row. The key out here just represents the encoder switch, so the down press of the encoder, and just it's hanging out here to not distract from everything else. So switching back to KiCad, um, you have to sort of start to lay this out somewhat organized, <laughs> and it can be really difficult. So what's difficult about it is kind of keeping track of what key is what, and then especially if we go back to these alternates, so I want this left key press to be wired directly to the same key press for this backspace, but I know that I need this key to be slightly different. Um, it needs to be on a different pin because our microcontroller needs to recognize it as a different press. So for the single keys, it's pretty easy. Um, I follow the naming pattern that I, that I that VIA uses and that I used in Keyboard Layout Editor. So I just say, you know, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, and it's all really easy until you get to something where you want to support multiple configurations. So in this case, um, this is where I start to use KiCad's symbol and footprint editor to my advantage a little bit more. I need to represent a switch that could be two units as a single key press or two one unit switches. So in the symbol editor, you have to have two switches because you need a maximum of representing two switches at one unit each. And then you can create a footprint where you have 
the 2U version that has a stabilizer holes for it and the pins are directly connected to the one of the 1U switches and then you also have that additional 1U with extra pins. You see pin 3 and pin 4 are not the same as 1 and 2 because this needs to represent a different switch. So going back to the symbol editor, you can see that you need to do that in every case that you have a layout that could be two, one, or, one or more options. So you see it in our 2U situation. We have it on the right shift, and we have it on the modifier row. Now, alternatively, you could, of course, probably place additional just plain old 1U switches and then wire it up in the schematic editor to have it make sense. I don't think it's as clean that way, and I think that this allows you to kind of visualize all the different labels that you have, and it can be in the exact layout that it's kind of going to appear in. So that's the entire schematic of the Graybert PCB. We went from microcontroller, all the peripherals, then all the switches. And then we'll jump in to the actual PCB itself. So here's the PCB editor for the Graybert PCB. And you can see kind of our layout starting to take shape. Now, just to follow along a little bit, this is our left side. This is our custom OLED footprint that has our I squared C lines. We've got our boot and reset pins here. Like I mentioned, they're not buttons. They're just pin headers that you can short out to make your connections because that's typically done in software anyways. We have our serial wire debug. We have our microcontroller in the center. We have our USB-C connector, rotor encoder, and voltage regulator. And then, of course, all of our keys. So. The thing to notice that we just mentioned was the symbol editor and how we just have this one symbol and footprint for the multiple switches. Now the reason this helps so much is because now we don't have to drag around and position exactly each switch for these multiple layout configurations, but we just have the one. Um, so it moves just like one component. And then we know that our stabilizer drill holes and the pins are in the right location. So you just go through here and lay it out. And if you've done a good job with your footprints in the footprint editor, you know, you should see all your lines matching up perfectly. And then you can have some pretty good confidence that you've done your layout correctly and you don't have a mis misaligned switch. A couple things to note is you always have to watch out for your stabilizer holes and make sure they're not overlapping a pin that's critical. So in this case, we have one drill hole that's kind of going into a pad. Now that leaves most of the pad still available, so that shouldn't be a problem. And then, of course, you need to also make sure that in this case, we have our stabilizer oriented kind of, let's say, correctly. But for the space bar, we actually rotate that around so that our big holes on top and our small holes on the bottom and our PCB isn't, doesn't have a hole on the edge. Um, so then this kind of brings up just kind of doing the layout. So what I always recommend is when you start out with your symbols from your schematic, never place your labels onto the microcontroller yet. So do your layout first put your like K011, but don't put it on your microcontroller because when you get into PCB design, then you need to sort of make sure it aligns right. So, you know, if you can use any GPIO pin on your microcontroller, you might as well have it be one that's conveniently located in the right spot for you. So I started because we're not using diodes and we have to pretty much get every single pin from a switch to the microcontroller, I started out just saying, okay, I'm gonna start on this corner and map it down to here, and then I'm just gonna work my way out, sort of like a spider web. And so you'd start here, look at what pin it is on the microcontroller, then see what switch it is, go back to your schematic editor, grab your label, stick it on the right pin. 
route your trace. Do that over and over and over again, routing all of your traces from your microcontroller down. And I think it creates this really quite beautiful um, effect of all of the traces going out to the switches. You always have to keep in mind you also have power and ground. To simplify things, all the ground pins are just connected to the ground plane. So if I turn on zones, see if they will come. So turn on zones and then you can see that each ground pin is just connected to the ground plane. And so we have ground planes on both sides. So if I go into KiCad and flip the board view, you see both top and bottom are ground. So the last thing to cover is some of the silk screening. Some of the silk screening may change, but for the most part, you get kind of default silk screen for each switch from the default KiCad library. But if you want to do your own custom thing, like our beautiful kitty cats here, um, or the logo, I really recommend a tool called SVT, SVG to Shenzhen where you can design your logo or whatever you want silk screened in Inkscape and then convert it to KiCad and you can actually place it just like a normal footprint. So that's how we did that there and then uh, eventually you should be able to use the 3D viewer of KiCad to actually see what your entire PCB will look like. Now this one actually can take some time to load because it's got so many components basically and traces. So then you start to see what your key ca your PCB will look like. Um, and in version six, you can actually see the holes breaking up the silk screen. So you'll, you'll see if that gets broken at all. And then you have your design. So there's a lot more kind of caveats and I may do more videos in the future. But one thing I do want to point out is always make sure to label when you have multiple layout configurations, what is what switch because when you go to start putting it together it'll be incredibly confusing if you don't put these labels in. So there you have it. That's kind of the breakdown of starting from kind of requirements what you want in your keyboard, doing the layout, doing the schematic in KiCad, then moving on over to the actual PCB layout. There's like like I said there's a lot a lot a lot more to it and a lot of brain tangling things um, such as like, you know, what pins of the microcontroller can I not use? Um, routing can always get really complicated, but I would encourage everyone to download KiCad, try out opening up some existing projects, see how they're done. Try for yourself to just do a super simple board and see what you come up with. Keep creating. Hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something, and I'll see you in the next video.